Fear drives me a lot. My biggest fear is like waking up and I'm 80 and like I didn't do anything in my life. I was always like, if I don't do this now, when am I ever going to do this? Like, when am I ever going to really try? I can't say I didn't try. Even if I failed to doing it, I, that's fine. But I can't fail because I didn't try. That's not okay with me. That's Melissa Carcacci. She's a producer, writer, and actress. She's best known for her role in the Nickelodeon show, Every Which Way. And she's got a new comedy series coming out called Hialeah. Melissa and I talk about her untraditional path as an actress, how she got her first big break, and the opportunities she created where none existed. You're listening to The Ground Up Show, a podcast that inspires creatives to make meaningful content and pursue their passions. My name is Matt Diavella, and I'm a filmmaker best known for the Netflix documentary Minimalism. And I'm sitting down with creators to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how to make an impact. So, Melissa, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Uh, I'm excited, too. Like You just told me that you just started a podcast of your own. I did, yeah. It has no name, which is like weird. I don't even know what I want to call it, but it's on Anchor. Um, and so we also film it as well, like I was telling you, where you can actually see where my guests work, because the whole idea is to show like kids and young adults like different jobs within the entertainment industry that's not necessarily like actor writer director like all types of jobs that maybe they didn't know exist right just showing that there's other opportunities because yeah. a lot of times all you see is just the people that are on camera yeah and you don't understand that there's this huge uh, orchestra behind them making everything work so many people <laughs> um is it so i imagine you've built a lot of connections that really allows you to open yeah. some doors and, and knock on some doors you otherwise might not have been able to get into oh yeah um, what what different areas are you looking to cover on your podcast I think for me, it's sort of like the unsung heroes, right? So it's almost like, you know, there's there's producers, right? But a lot of people don't even know what producers do. And they do a lot of different things. And there's different producers for different areas of the job. Um, you know, makeup artists, costume um, designers, and, you know, wardrobe people that people don't know about as well. Um, even some executives, too. Like, I really want to talk to some of the people from my Nickelodeon family and sort of, like, showcase what they do. Um, because even as a kid, I didn't know that these jobs existed until I was a real set and I'm like wow there's so many people needed to sort of make this show or this project happen and so I think it would be really really interesting to show that it can be intimidating too when you first I remember yeah. I did uh, I haven't done many big shoots like most of my work is in the independent world mm -hmm. but your first time walking on a shoot where you have like 40 50 people behind yeah. the camera trying to make everything work yeah uh, to make everything look like there wasn't a hundred people there exactly um, it can be pretty daunting to understand it all and piece it all together so I'm I'm, yeah. I'm ready and interested to get into your podcast yeah. I'm excited. Uh, did you release any episodes yet? Or are you building up a little bit of a... Well, there's an episode with my friend Ivan who works at ESPN that's on my anchor page, but I'm struggling to sort of like kind of lock everybody in schedules. Also, like I have a lot of um, obstacles when it comes to filming on like their job locations because a lot of these businesses that are big companies don't really allow for cameras to come in. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. So it's like coming out little by little. Yeah. But I have one episode up. Right. I like that you just started and that's what I did too because a lot of times we make a lot of excuses about yeah. why to hold off. Oh, I got to record 10 episodes, 20 episodes. Yeah. But the fact that you just got started, you put it out there in the world and then it makes it a little bit easier to, to gain momentum and keep going. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, you got the podcast. So for people who don't know about your work, tell me a little bit about what else you've got going on right now. Um, okay, so primarily I'm an actress. Um, I started acting when I was 14 years old. Um, my first big break came when I was 24 and I was on a Nickelodeon show called Every Which Way. I did that for four seasons. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I actually opened up my production company in 2010 and I mainly did that because no one was giving me an opportunity to act. I was doing a lot of commercials and local things in Miami, which is where I'm from. Um, but I said, if I don't do this for myself, I'm never going to get a break. Um, and so the first show I sold was a reality show based on my family. And right when we were going to go to networks, my family, like my parents backed out. They were like, mm. this is not for us. We don't want to sort of be this like open about our lives and I was like oh okay I was really sad about it um but then Nickelodeon came knocking and I was like oh I guess I'm not sad anymore and I guess I don't need this company anymore <laughs> yeah I was very wrong because like once I got like on the show I loved being on the show but I was like not 100% happy and I realized that I was missing my company a lot and I missed sort of that building from the ground up and like you know pitch meetings and building the show and what is you know it was so much fun for me so I said okay once this show wraps up I'm going straight into that um and I did so I revived my, my production company in the first 
project that I did is Hialeah, which is a new scripted comedy series that comes out November 11th on Facebook. Um, and so that's kind of what I've been doing now. I've been promoting the show and it's been great. That's great. So yeah. we will go back, but it's kind of interesting because Hialeah, a lot of what the show is about mm-hmm. is about your experiences growing up too and, yeah. and the Cuban culture. So yeah. tell me a little bit about what it was like for you growing up and when did you first start to take an interest in acting? It's funny because like, it's really hard to pinpoint a, a time when I wanted to act. I, I would say five because that was the first time I ever did like a play in the kindergarten. Um, and I begged my mom for years and she was like, no, I don't want you to like, you know, give up your childhood for acting or to work or anything like that. So around 14, she was like, okay, fine. I'll let you start taking classes. And then from there, I got an agent and manager started auditioning. Um, so I've always wanted to act and I've always loved entertainment. That seems like pretty quick succession of of things kind of falling in place because a lot of people work really hard to get agents and (laughs) managers and all this stuff it's so crazy because i talk about this with my friends all the time i can get an agent very easily and a manager super easy but i can't get auditions Mm. which makes no it's like why do i even have a representation you know what i'm saying i would think it would be the opposite yeah it's super weird for me and that's literally been my history since i was 14 and so i just feel like what i'm really supposed to do is sort of create my own projects it's just that has come so easily and naturally to me that it's it's almost like denying something that it's supposed to be Mm -hmm. you know what i mean um because doing the whole like even producing you know the Hialeah show and even the reality show back in the day it came so effortlessly to me it was made sense to me um it's just I feel like that's sort of my calling sort of like the traditional route of being an actor is not it never was yeah you know as much as like I didn't want that because obviously this route that I'm doing now is a lot harder but I sort of like enjoy it more because I love challenges like that's what gets me excited about life it's like I, I like to set a really high goal that's somewhat impossible to meet, but then start meeting them little by little. So like my end goal is to have a studio in Miami. Like that's mm. my dream. And so like I was like, I have to set something that's sort of like really hard to achieve. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to. I think most people don't do enough of that yeah. these days where it's dreaming big. Yeah. But I think one of the big things about what you did was that you decided to get into production yourself and mm-hmm. it was not waiting for the opportunities to come. It was right. literally making them right. because uh, so many people, they just wait for the opportunities. Well, it's funny because like my dad gave me the best birthday gift ever at 20, at my 21st birthday, he gave me a MacBook Pro and a screenwriters program. And he said, if nobody's going to give you the opportunity, give yourself the opportunity. And that changed my whole life. Did your parents encourage you from an early age to get into acting and to pursue this route? My dad was sort of, my dad is sort of like the softy, right? So like whatever we want to do, he's like supportive. My mom thinks about a lot of like the little things that he doesn't think about like for example like when I wanted to act as a kid she thought about okay great I support it but if I don't want her to do it because she'll give up her school her friends her childhood and then when she's like 30 she's gonna say wow I didn't have like a childhood or I didn't get to experience prom or those types of things so I'm so grateful that now that I'm almost 30 um I look back and say I'm so glad my mom did that for me and made that decision for Mm -hmm. me you made a big leap too, right out of high school to yeah. decide to move to LA and, yep. and, and pursue this career. Yeah. What was life like at that point? Did you have any opportunities? Had you gotten any gigs at that point? So it's a funny thing happened when I was 16, sort of like everything came to me at once, right? So I had this great manager. Um, I came out to LA and I did this, um, it was called Best New Talent. I don't think that exists anymore, but it's this big competition out here. And I got 13 callbacks. I got my first LA agent. I mean, it was just like, bam, bam, just like all these things. And I said, wow, I'm actually, I think I'm going to make it. You know what I mean? (laughs) Um, And then when they said you have to come off for pilot season, which now pilot season doesn't really even exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, My mom was like, no, she's got to graduate high school and then cross the bridge when we get there. So my agent dropped me and then everything just started to crumble. And I said, all right, well, when I'm 18 and I graduate high school, here's a diploma, mom. I'm moving to LA. I did not go to college. I still have not stepped foot in a college. Um, And it was really weird because I had nothing. So I came here with just my dog. I knew no one in the city. I had no connections. Um, I sort of like revisited back like my old agent, but he didn't want to resign me. And it was just like a lot of negative things for the next three years. Um, It was really hard on me, like emotionally, mentally, it was really, really hard. Um, So I kind of just went back to Miami, regrouped. um, And then my dad gave me that great gift. (laughs) And then I Mm. opened up my production company and then sort of built from there. What what was it about those three years that when you look back on it, 
wasn't working. You know, it's funny because I'm Latina and my parents are Cuban, but I was born in Miami. And so like I was raised with like, I'm American. So when I moved out here and my best friends who were blonde hair, blue eyed from Texas were going on these amazing roles, I would tell my agent at the time, like, oh, I want to go out on those roles. And they're like, well, you can't. And I'm like, why not? Well, because you're Latina. Well, what does that even all mean? It's, you know, mm-hmm. well, the way you look. Mm-hmm. So they put me in a box. And at that time, there was no roles for people like me that looked like me. Um, now there's a lot. Thankfully, we have a lot of opportunity now. But back in the day, there wasn't. We had mm-hmm. a writer's strike happen during that time, which kind of shut down um, the industry for a while. So like just a lack of opportunity. Yeah, it seems like even in the past five to 10 years, it's changed so much and yeah. so many doors have opened up. I just had uh, this guy, Alex Ferrari, on the podcast. He mm-hmm. runs a website called Indie Film Hustle. Uh, and just talking about the industry and how it's evolved and changed over time. And it's it's amazing how much opportunity there has been given now to people yeah. who can just pick up a camera and just start a video blog. You it like time is time. And yeah. if you can hold somebody's attention for an hour, an yeah. hour and a half, you know, for advertisers, for people who want to see it, for people who value that, that's the same exact thing as a movie or a TV yeah. show. Time is time. Yeah. Um, when you first got that computer and mm-hmm. what, so what did, did you have an idea in mind? You started writing right away and started hatching up. I was, I've never written anything. I mean, not like that, a script. I was like, I don't, I don't know how to do this. But then I just started like writing. Um, it was a show about high school and kids in Miami. And I was like, well, I've always wanted to be in a show like this. So I'll just write sort of like what my dream part would be and so I wrote a one hour pilot just like within a few days like within two or three Mm. days I was done and I was like oh wow this is not as bad as I thought I mean obviously it's I read it now and it's not the best work (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) but you know just to sort of like get my feet wet and see if that's something of interest um I got really excited I was like oh I have something here you know this is something I really enjoy doing so um yeah, that, that changed my life. Mm-hmm. That that night changed my life. So what were the next steps after that? So you, are you living at home at this point? You're just yes. trying to regroup and uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's not that easy. I had a similar yeah. experience where I graduated college and then I moved in with my sister in Philly mm-hmm. and I'm about to start getting these student loan payments coming in at six, seven hundred dollars a month. And I'm like, I can't even afford that, let alone rent. So I'm going to move home with my parents and just... Yeah try to it's great to have that to fall back on to have that support system is so important especially when you're trying to do something that's a little bit crazy that's you're not taking a traditional path um so what were the next steps after that both my parents are entrepreneurs so for them it was like you need to open up a company and you Mm. need to start making your own stuff um and so that's sort of what i did my mom helped me do that um my mom is like the best because like both of my parents are really great like i you know I saw them build three businesses before this one they're in construction now that failed Mm. and I just saw them never giving up it was like that that sort of like energy and that mentality was sort of like I guess like just inputted in me as a kid and so that's always like that's how I'm able to survive because Mm -hmm. I always saw my parents like failing and still like getting back up and building again until they make it until they succeed um and so she opened up, you know, helped me open up my production company. And that's where we started. The first thing was the was the reality show. We thought it was a great idea because the Kardashians had come out. We're like, well, we're kind of like them. I think we yeah. should do that. You know, so it was like me, my, my sister's a singer. My brother uh, is a drummer. Um, and so it was like the three kids trying to make it in the entertainment business while the parents run a construction company. Yeah, writes you know? itself. <laughs> yeah, writes That's itself, amazing. you know. And so, and it was a Cuban family and no one has ever seen that. So we thought yeah. it was a great idea. And even till this day, I watch a sizzle room and I'm like, that would have been a great show. I just don't think it would have been great for our family. Yeah, you, know? you, you got to be careful because exactly. that's so important. And there are certain decisions that you can make that you can't go yeah. back on and you can't take them back. Yeah. Um, have you always been uh, open and, and vulnerable? And, you know, that reality show 24-7, people getting access to your life, has yeah. that always come naturally to you to be vulnerable in person or in public? No, I'm actually a very private person. Yeah. Um, and that's why doing the vlog too is really hard for me. And I'm, I really want to like overcome that. And I think that's why even more so I do it um, because I, I'm afraid of judgment. I mean, it's probably like the actor thing inside of me where I'm just like, please, everybody like me because that mm-hmm. used to be my job. Like now I don't even care. I go on other shows. I'm like, great. If you like me, great. And if not, it's fine because I'm creating my own stuff. I really don't care. Yeah. You know, but back in the day, that's all I had was like, if I don't get this job, I have no money and I don't have anything. So it's almost like, please like me. And that's, that's sort of like... Uh, natural now to me you know what I mean to sort of have that instinct oh like me don't judge me am I you know am I pretty enough am I good enough you know and I just I'm 
I'm just taking that all away. I'm like, I really don't care. Yeah. I think it's probably the combination of the experience of having been through it before. And it's very hard to learn some lessons just by reading about them. Like you could have been told that at a young age and it still wouldn't have affected you, but you had to go through it. And then now that you've been through it, you realize you're like, well, you know, you go on 200 auditions and you Mm -hmm. get one of them that really count. So it's not worth it to get worked up on every one. Exactly. But it's hard. It's hard not to. (laughs) It is really so difficult. hard, yeah. Because yeah. you want every single one. Yeah. Or at least to make a good impression in front of the casting director so they call you back for something else. Sure. You know. So you go on this audition mm-hmm. for Every Which Way. Yeah. And your life changes in two and a half weeks. Yeah. Uh, talk Crazy. about that experience from, from going into the first reading. Okay, so it's funny. I auditioned for a web series <clears throat> a month before the Every Which Way audition. And... Literally, the casting director walked me out of, out to my car and said, you got this job. I was like, that's great. You know, it's going to be my first thing. It's a web series. It's going to be great. They end up not calling me. And I call my agent. And I'm like, what's going on with this? Like, I thought I got the part. And she's like, oh, they went with somebody else. And I'm like, that is so... I'm like, no, that, that can't be. Like, they said I pretty much got it. So long story short, I get this email from my agent like a couple weeks later or a month after. And she's like, have you auditioned for this role? It was called Grachi at the time because our show is the English version of Grachi, which is a Latin American um, Nickelodeon show that was huge for the network. Um, and I said, no, but I'll go out on it. And I read the script and I'm like, oh, this is fun. And I've always wanted to be on Nickelodeon. So um, so I auditioned. I did the callback within two days after that. And two weeks after that, I was at my first table. I mean, it was just like, I didn't really have to test for network. I mean, they say they submitted my tape to network, but I don't know that, Mm -hmm. you know, but it was just like audition callback and I booked it, which doesn't happen. So network TV is actually really hard. Like you have a lot of steps. I didn't, I skipped all that. Mm -hmm. And when you signed, did I mean, you had an agent, but were you part of the Screen Actors Guild at the time? I'm still non-union actually. You're non-union, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they didn't, they don't have, they don't hire a union on that show? So our show, because it was, uh, so Nickelodeon Latin America produced it, we could do non-union. Mm -hmm. Um, And in Florida, too, you had to write to work state so you don't have to be Mm -hmm. union. Um, And we shot in Miami. So what's going through your head at that time? Like going into that room with all these Mm -hmm. other actors and actresses, you're you're meeting them for the first time, the directors and producers. Um, What does that feel like for you? This is like a pretty big deal for you. Do you realize how big it is at the time? Well, it's crazy because for some reason I thought this was for Latin America just because I I knew what Grachi was um, until uh, Rafael de la Fuente who plays Julio. Now he's doing great things in Dynasty now. He's great. He tells me, no, no, this is not for Latin America. This is for America. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, this is for Nickelodeon America? Really? I was like, oh my God. And he was like, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh. I did not know it was this big. So I freaked out a little bit and then I got yeah. really, really excited. Um, and then we just we just started. And yeah, when all the executives of like Nickelodeon, LA and New York came, I was like, oh wow, this is like legit. This is the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, how long is that production process when you're just starting, you know, learning the script and yeah. kind of getting used to this role? When do you start? filming and actually shooting the show season Mm, one that's a good question um i would say i mean we really don't have a lot to prep Mm -hmm. i think we pretty much started right away i think we shot within three months i think three months we shot a whole season but something interesting happens every time i would start a season i would be like so on point like on set and everybody towards the end of the season it's like we would start flubbing lines it was just Mm -hmm. i don't know what it was i guess it was because you're consuming this all day every day that's towards the end it's like you're you're mentally like start to get a little off what do the days look like is it like 10 hour days or is it oh yeah you're working 10 to 12 hours yeah yeah yeah. usually like with the bigger productions it's it takes quite a bit of time and our show aired every day so we didn't wow. do once a week, right? So we had a lot more episodes than what a normal show would have. Yeah, so you have three you have uh, three months of how many episodes are you shooting over that time? Oof, if we were shooting... We, well, we aired... I'm not good at math, but yeah. I guess like five times a week times four because we yeah. were just in one whole month. So it doesn't episodes. give you much time to overthink what you're doing, right? And the acting yeah. you're doing, you're just like, you know, have oh. to nail it, got to move on to the next thing. Yeah, plus we shot out of order too. Because we, hmm. so we would shoot by sets, right? So whatever, so I played nurse Lily. So in our set, the nurse's office, whatever we had that like week, we had to shoot it all in that set uh. that week. And so it would be episode one, five. So, I mean, it would just be all over the place. You start to get some attention for it. Like mm-hmm. when did, when did that happen? Was it like episode one, season one releases? And then all of a sudden people start, um, 
Mm, sort of. Yeah. So so something interesting happened. So when like the first episode aired, we actually did not get good reviews on Twitter. So mm. like every, I would check on the hashtag or like even just type every which way and see who's talking about it. And like it was all negative comments. So that's kind of where like a little thing rang in my head. And I was like, I'm just going to start liking and like tweeting to everybody. I'm like, oh, I hope you watch tomorrow or like, you know, give our show a chance or whatever. Mm-hmm. And kids started to freak out because they would see that the girl that was on the show was tweeting them. Yeah. So I <laughs> used this sort of like as a little tactic to start getting like followers and yeah. they attention to the show. Um, and it worked and it worked. Just that hashtag and going in there really worked. That's funny. But it also brings up this point of receiving negative attention and negative criticism which is really tough Uh, especially when you're just getting started out this is like your big break this is your first thing and now you're starting to see people like hating on you and the haters come out how do you deal with that at first because it can be challenging to you know put a lot of yourself into something Mm -hmm. to really build this up to be a big thing and then all of a sudden it's so easy for people to be like this is stupid like I don't (laughs) don't like this yeah it's super well I'm a very um optimistic a positive person by nature right so like even just to tweet something negative bugs me like sometimes even if I have a headache I'm like oh I have such a headache I can't do it it just (laughs) drives me nuts yeah um and so all I was doing was sort of just like you know give us another chance I would just sort of talk to them and just say you know the show's great. Keep watching the season and you'll like this or this will happen or I don't know, get mm-hmm. them all excited about something. So it was it was like at first I was like, oh, I guess we're not going to get a second season. I mean, the fact that we did four is like crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but just making that effort of sort of just like fl- trying to switch their minds. I mean, there were some, granted, some people that were like, I hate you, you know? And yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. whatever. I'm just going to ignore you. Move on to the next person. You Those know? ones are like the easiest yeah. ones to ignore. The ones that are, they're clearly crazy. They clearly have, haven't even watched the show yeah. or watched the film. Yeah. Um, but you just have to kind of push it to the side. I try not yeah. to look at any of it because, but it's it's, it's, it's impossible really. Like it is. you're going to see some stuff. If you're uploading a video, you're going to poke around. You're, oh, there's a notification. Oh, that person yeah. said a mean thing. Yeah. But like for the most part, I, you can't let it get to you and you just have to keep creating. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that is important? Like the engagement with the audience and your fans, especially now yeah. as you're starting to develop your own original content? Well, that's everything. I mean, the, more than a commercial on TV, like if you have no engagement with like the audience online, you have nothing Mm -hmm. because that's really what blows up your project that seems like a challenging thing to do because it's a major time commitment so is it beyond the the facebook live stuff like that's that's obviously is connecting and you're taking questions from people and you can really start this dialogue um like how far does it go i think you have to literally answer every comment or every tweet or like i mean you just you have to it's Mm -hmm. part of if you don't it's because without the fans or without the engagement who's going to watch sort of your content you know Mm -hmm. people are just they're going to think well you're too cool for school so Mm -hmm. whatever you know and i've seen a lot of artists do that and so they start to decline in numbers they start to Mm. decline in engagement and sort of you need that to get people excited for your projects i think that's so crucial In in an early stage i would say i completely agree with you like at a certain scale it probably becomes more difficult and you have to get a little yeah, bit more creative with how to touch totally totally like for me especially when the show was on the air i would take i mean two hours of my time after the show was aired just answering as much as i possibly can doing follow sprees like giving something back to them you know what i mean i think it's important for me to not just be like oh i'm so glad that you're giving me attention but i should have to acknowledge them i should give them a like or Mm -hmm. i should you know just say thank you or follow them back yeah especially early on though i feel like though the comments actually are what keep me going like the positive reinforcement the people that message me and say oh your film helped me or this podcast really got me to think about you know the work i do in a different way without that (laughs) a lot of times you feel like you're just like talking to a brick wall like you Mm -hmm. don't always get the attention especially Mm -hmm. at the very beginning of a project when times are most tough when you're most likely to give up and and quit on a project yeah um so you you finish up this tv show and then you you said i i kind of was assuming that you might have this feeling of what now after you do this big show did you have an experience of what now what next or had you kind of lined up the pieces and expected the show to end and had expected what you wanted to do after the show um, well, we knew at the beginning of season four, the, the executives, we had a meeting that this would be our last season. So I already knew that the next two to three months were it for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew I was coming back to Los Angeles. Um, I thought that I was going to book jobs. You know, I didn't know to what capacity, but I was like, it'll be fine. I'll be able to survive, book a couple of jobs. I'll be, 
I'll be okay. But I started writing another scripted series um, right after that as well that I kind of was like, okay, well, this will be my next move while I'm getting this show made. I'm booking jobs. I didn't book any jobs. Mm. Zero, none. It went back to sort of like what I was at 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Um, 21. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 22, 23. Yeah, because I booked every which way at 24. Um, yeah, no auditions. Wow. It went back to that again. I was like, God, to be kidding me. Because yeah. the whole excuse when I was out here was, well, you don't have a resume. Well, now I have a, a series of four seasons. I have all these commercials and hosting jobs. And you're still not giving me auditions? Mm. Like, what do I have to do? Um and it just went back to like this voice inside my head. It's like, Melissa, you have to go back to your company. That's not, you know, you are not a traditional actress. You have mm-hmm. to accept that. Um, and so I said, I'm just going to have to do it. And um, so I developed a whole new script of comedy. Uh, well, it's a, not a comedy, it's a dramedy with my sister. Um, and then Hialeah too was born. Uh, actually, Hialeah was born last year, believe it or not. Wow. So you so, guys really moved on that quick. Oh, yeah. So David Vargas and Javier Mayol, who are my two co-creators, um, when I met David at Starbucks right before, right after Thanksgiving, so it was like, yeah, right after Thanksgiving, right before December, um, and I said, I really want to make the show because I grew up watching um, Que Pase USA, which was like a big show in the 70s and 80s. I used to watch reruns with my parents about mm-hmm. a Cuban family that moves from Cuba to Miami. And I said, I really want to make something like this, but not this. Um, and he was like, oh, funny, like me and Javier have been wanting to make a show like that. And I was like, okay, so let's just do the show. And he's like, well, when do you want to do it? And I was like, I want to do it the first week of January. And he was like, okay. He's like, between the holidays and the whole, and I was like, yeah, we could do it. I want to do eight episodes. He was like, yeah. oh, no, no. He's like, we'll do six. I don't know if we can do eight. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine, I'll settle for six. Um, and within three weeks, we pre-produced it, casted it, shot it, everything. Wow, how did, you, how did you meet up with him? It wasn't a ran. You didn't run randomly walk into a, a, a coffee shop. No, I've known him since high school. Oh, okay, and I ran into him on a flight from LA to Miami, and something inside of me was telling me to call him. Mm. And, and he's so a filmmaker. Yeah. He, he's directed a couple projects. One yeah, he made films. a film, Love and Hostages, him and Javier. Yeah. Um, and I saw the film and I loved it. So I knew he was like, he'll be great for the job. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've also known him for such a long time. So just like working with family. So I knew that we were going to execute something really special. Okay, so for somebody who has wants to create their a series or a show or a film, how does this process go? You, you meet up with uh, him in a coffee shop, and you're starting to talk about this idea. Mm-hmm. There's a script that's already there. He already has no. this series. Okay, so there's no, nothing. nothing. There's just an idea. It's just an idea. Okay, so what's so, the next step? So the next step, okay, so the first thing I did was like, okay, great. I have this idea. Who do I need? So I said, okay, I need somebody who can direct and film and I need a writer um and David provided sort of that Mm -hmm. so I said okay I pitched him sort of my idea luckily he had the same idea too so it was great (laughs) um and so his partner Javier is a writer and so we just started throwing ideas what's the story going to be about so once we got to the story then Javier just kind of went off and running which to me you know he's so great because he and he was turning around these scripts like nobody's business i was Mm. like oh my gosh like this guy is brilliant um and they were really funny and they were great um and also the challenge too was we wanted to do short form content so it's Mm. like how do you do short form content that still keeps the audience engaged without sort of like dragging the story or cutting the story because it's it's very it's hard to do short form. Are you saying the the series is short form or these are the additional pieces that you're making? So the episodes are short form. Yeah, so okay. it's like um, they're r- roughly about, I would say between nine and 12 minutes mm-hmm. long. Um, but how do you sort of combine what a 30 minute episode would look like on normal television into a nine minute episode mm. and still keep people engaged to watch all six? Right. Um, and so that's sort of the talent that Javier has where I was like, wow, this is crazy. And he was just so good at it. Um, so let's do, do broad strokes. Like, what yeah. is the series about? So the series is about um, this young couple named Mari and Kay um, who meet at Chicago um, in the university. And so they move back into my character, Mari Bolsa's family's house in Hialeah because they're newlyweds. They don't have a lot of money. Um, and they're sort of trying to figure out life. Um, he still doesn't really have a job. She just got a job. And it's sort of like what what as a young couple how do you figure that out but also how do you mix two worlds together because he's not hispanic Mm. so and he's like he's just a white jewish guy (laughs) (laughs) and um and religions like how do you mix that like how does that all look like in a cuban family which becomes to be very challenging um but i think very interesting because i think now in a time where america is so diverse um how do we all sort of like work together as a big happy family in this country and that's sort of like what this family dynamic with these two characters sort of like 
reflect. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I saw just you, yeah. you've only put out a couple little teasers yes. and scenes from it, yes. but you kind of get without even much dialogue, you kind of get a full mm-hmm. picture of how the series is going to progress. Yeah. Um, and it's also really cool because what you're doing outside of just the series, I've seen some of the almost documentary type interviews, yeah. uh, interviewing with people that live in Hylia, Florida. Yeah. Uh, talking about their stories and how they got into it. And even now Hurricane Irma came yeah. through and really doing, like it, it's really an interesting time for, mm-hmm. for all this show to come out and for the series to come out because you have this hurricane come in. Yeah. Um, talk about some of the stuff that you've been doing now on that front to just try to drive awareness for like the rebuilding. I was home with wow. my parents when Irma happened and uh, we filled up. So I don't know what they're called. And I keep saying this in all interviews, but you know those water tank things that you know when people in offices have like those things where you just press the, yeah, the water coolers yeah 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 so i think they're like five gallons or something yeah. like that yeah, pretty so big. we had 16 of those because my parents have that at their house um and i said to my mom you know we have 16 empty ones we should fill them up with clean water just in case we don't have any power we could take a shower or whatever mm-hmm. luckily we only lost power for 24 hours which was great but I said, what a shame. Like, we have 16 of these. I'm sure there's people in the Keys that need it. Um, so David Vargas and I, my director, went down to the Keys and started to, to like distribute these waters to these people that needed it in Key West. Um, we went all the way down to the southernmost point, which is about a four-hour drive from Miami to, to that point. Um, and they were really bad. But when we were asking around, they were doing okay when it came to sort of like, you know, water. Their water still kind of worked in their homes Mm -hmm. and they were getting water from fema and red cross so they were they were doing okay they said but big pine key was the worst so we drove back up again to big pine key and sure enough it was i mean it was so sad to see because it was so devastated um and so these people were sort of trapped in their trailer homes or their homes and we just went knocking door to door do you need clean water to take a shower and everyone was like i mean one guy sort of crying because he was like i just i didn't think that i would get this like he mm. said we have drinking water but we don't have like and we don't want to waste it on taking a shower mm-hmm. um so thank you for bringing it to us and like i was so sad when i gave out that last one because i'm like my god i still had the other side because it was like two streets i still had the other side and i wish i could have mm. but it's tough it's amazing though that you can even just in a small way just doing something like that change yeah. people's lives and yeah. i mean when people are at their lowest or at a point when um, it doesn't seem very hopeful to, mm-hmm. to just to help one person, I think, can have a ripple effect. Oh, yeah, totally. And I mean, they were closed off. The keys were closed off for over a week. Even if you lived there and you left, you could not come back. You know, I love happened. what you did there. And I loved, um, like I was saying, the rest of the, the interviews. Like you you had the, the one of the councilmen who you also went to oh, school yeah, with I on did, set yeah. hanging out. Yeah. It seems like a really amazing, strong community there. Well, the whole goal, too, to show like these like um, places in Hialeah is to, show the people that built the city um you know the city was really ba- you know kind of built by latins you know cubans dominicans puerto ricans um and so the why the, the community is so strong is that sort of family unison that's like they brought their countries to the united states in a way mm-hmm. um and i just wanted to raise awareness on these great businesses that are doing great things or you know places that people maybe don't know about and welcome them into what this world is like because literally if you visit hialeah you feel like you're in another country like it just doesn't feel like yeah. you're in the United States, you know, and um, and it's just a nice way of saying like, welcome to the family. And what what is Cuban culture? What makes Cuban culture distinctive and unique? It's crazy because like all Latin cultures are so different. Like my boyfriend is Dominican, and although it's still a Caribbean island, next you know, a Caribbean Latin island, mm-hmm. um, we are very different in culture. Um, I don't know what makes us different. I mean, I would say we're definitely very loud. Mm-hmm. Um, our accent is different than all the other accents. Um, our food is different. Pretty, I'm pretty to religious. To I mean, is most most Hispanic communities are pretty religious. Yeah, yeah. yeah they are. Um, they are. Yeah, cause, like just seeing some of the. Uh, the some of the scenes that you guys had shot like they have the pictures of jesus like really big beautiful pictures of jesus every cuban house has a picture of jesus yeah. like the most beautiful picture. yeah yeah it's like a ama- it's huge too like yeah. in the bedroom my mom yeah. my mom has that too but we're italian uh catholic but <laughs> yeah, yeah she's true. she's got the uh the jesus picture as well um with those scenes and like everything you shot um like how did you guys raise a budget for it and like were some of these things they look really authentic like this is you're filming in somebody's home how much oh, yeah. uh was actually 
intact. So we shot in my dad's uncle's house in East Hialeah, which is like, you can't get more Hialeah than this house. And like everything's pristine. So I was even like kind of like um, scared with the crew because I'm like, don't scratch the floor. Don't scratch the table. Because yeah. not a scratch. I mean, they every Hialeah house is like impeccable. Um, so we shot for actually no money. So literally mm. this was a passion project across the board. We just made sure that our cast and crew was well fed, well taken care of, but everybody on board was just so like obsessed with the story and so in love with it. They were like, we got to be a part of this. Um, and so we got very lucky that everybody gave not only a hundred percent, but delivered my God, the best work. That's amazing. Like how yeah. do you, how do you do that? How do you approach those conversations and getting people inspired? Because yeah. I personally, when I got started out, it was say yes to everything I can. I need wedding videos, bar mitzvahs, mm -hmm. like whatever it was. I need work. I need experience. And also, if I could find something that I also, like I was passionate about, that I yeah. love to do, that was a really exciting project, that makes it even better. Yeah. But I'm also hesitant and I, I'm I, like to bring on somebody to a project and not pay them because I've, I've certainly had mm -hmm. people take advantage of me. I've certainly had people who have uh, had me do projects for much less than what I deserved. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach those conversations and how do you get people inspired and uh, on board on a project like this? It's really hard. I, I would say always start off with friends because yeah. when it comes to friends, it's almost like you're helping each other out and it doesn't feel like... Um, like you're doing a favor for someone you don't know. Um, for me, it, I mean, two of the people that were on my Every Which Way show, um, Elizabeth Elias and Renee Lavon, who were on Every Which Way, came on to Elizabeth play, play my sister, Renee play my dad. And then, you know, David knew, you know, one other cast member. So like everybody kind of knew somebody. Um, for me, the most intimidating actors to ask and I was really nervous to ask them were the grandparents mm. so Marta Velasco and Marcos Casanova are legends within the theater community in Miami like I grew up watching them um in the theater and I was like really freaking out to ask them because I'm like how am I gonna ask these professional legend ac legendary actors to do this for free <laughs> um, but I called Marta first and I you know I told her about it and I said you know I just you know my goal is to really like put it out there and like get a deal or something you know just I really sold the idea of what I wanted to do yeah. and then prayed that I would be able to execute it because you know you're promising these things and obviously anything could happen but I was like well that's good because it would motivate me more to get a deal done you know mm -hmm. um and she said yes she was like I would love to be a part of it she's like I normally do not say yes to this stuff but I don't know why I feel like I need to say yes to this and I'm like oh my god she's like but I only have one one condition I said what is it She's like, that Markles will play my husband because I don't trust anybody else to play him but him. And I was like, well, that that's fantastic because now <laughs> yeah. I don't have to go looking for the grandfather. You wow. know what I mean? I'm like, no, that's great. So, because I put on a casting notice and no one submitted for the grandparents. And this was like a few days before that's we started shooting. so tough shooting. to cast for. So, and it's, There's so, not that many old actors like that, that level. Yeah, not only that, but the accent. The Cuban uh. accent is so specific. And that's what I said. If we don't have the grandparents as authentic as possible, we don't have a show. Wow. We just don't because it, the acts and everything has to be very specific. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how I pulled that off. I don't know. I don't know. That's all God because I can't. Yeah. I can't. And yeah. so this is where good producing uh, yeah. is important. <laughs> I mean, this is like your, is this your technically your first producing project? Yeah. Like seeing it through from beginning to yeah. end. Uh, what was that experience like? And and like, is it made up of these moments where you're like, yeah. I got to call this person. I really need to make a good impression. I really need yeah. them to like, I need to win them over to my way of thinking. Um, you know, how, what was your experience like as a producer on this project? Um, it's hard because you have to sort of like, I mean, with social media, it's easy to sort of get the rest of the cast because everybody has social media, right? But for these characters in particular, they don't. So what I did was I literally went to all the theaters <clears throat> in Calle Ocho and knocked on their door and asked them if they had actors that I could call and that's how I got Martha's number I don't mm. know if that was legal or not but I got it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah it's sort of like okay I'm gonna have to put my ego aside and sort of like just just feet on the ground calm down and let's call and let's try to make this happen and if it doesn't happen what's your next plan what's your next move so I almost always have a plan mm -hmm. so this is what I want this is what I'm gonna try to get but if I don't get that what's my plan b so I'm always like okay problem solution problem solution that's sort of and that's how I navigate life period mm -hmm. you know it's sort of like what's the solution to every problem i don't set a complain and wallow that's and i'm not a quitter so it's like really i don't have that personality so i feel like producing is like just a natural thing for me 
you know? It, yeah, very much problem solving. Yeah. Because if this thing doesn't work out, if they say no, she's just not, you know, yeah. feeling well, she's already booked on another project. All right, well, we have to fill that somehow. Yeah. And there's got to be somebody who can fill the role. Yeah. And it's a matter of finding them. Um, uh, it's probably what's helpful for you is that you've been doing this for a while and you built up these relationships. Right. So relationships are so important. And when you're getting started out, it, it's obviously much more difficult. Yeah. Um, but you can kind of tap into those circles that you already had. Mm -hmm. What Were there any other challenges of producing this project? I mean, I think anytime you produce a project with a budget of zero dollars, there's so <laughs> many challenges. I did it with yeah. minimalism. Ugh. But um, yeah, what were some of the challenges that you saw? Um, well, shooting at my dad's uncle's house, which honestly he thought we were going to come in with an iPhone and a little flashlight. Uh -huh. Like he did not expect this whole crew with like cameras and cast to sort of bombard his home. Yeah. Um, that was definitely a struggle because actually his wife had just had open heart surgery, which I didn't know. And I'm like, wow. well, this is, you know, this is horrible. This, you know, she needs to rest. Yeah. Um, so timing was, was very hard on us. Sort of like, he was like, well, you can't shoot here all day, you know? So we had those time constraints. Also our cast, had other things that they had to get to. So it was like, okay, well, who do we have from this time to this time? And what scenes can we shoot? And it was more problem solving, mm -hmm. like small little obstacles versus like anything major that stopped production at all. Um, I mean, I literally like the night before we started shooting, I remember I was vlogging with Andres and I said to him, this is going to go to crap. I was like, this shoot is going to go to crap because everything has just gone so smoothly. There's no way that the shoot could go so smoothly. And it really did with just mm. those minor things. It did because we got the we got a great product. Yeah, we really did. That's what's I think great about like when you have a small knit crew. Like, yeah. how, what was your crew? Like five, ten people or so. Like five with cast people. and crew. Yeah. Well, yeah, with cast maybe about ten. Maybe yeah. about ten. Yeah. If we did but the big family scenes. Sure, but <clears throat> it's so much easier to be flexible and say, okay, actually, we're not going to shoot inside now. We're yeah. going to do this scene outside first because we're not able to get access to it. Yeah. Um, well, our hardest scene to shoot was episode five. We did a quinceanera practice, a real one. So, so a quinceanera practice. Okay, so I nailed that word, by the way. Yeah, you did. That was really that was, good. <laughs> yeah, it's not my first time saying that word. Uh, no, it totally is. Um, so yeah, what was a practice though? It's it's a practice for the birthday right. party. Right. So you do. So like quinceaneras are like legit. They're like productions. Okay. Yeah. And so like you have to rehearse once in advance to put on the show for your friends and family, um, which sounds insane, but it's part <laughs> of our culture. Yeah. Um, I won't even tell you what my quinceanera was. Oh, but really? um, so Amy Keo, um, who's the wife of Pedro Keo, who owned Vicky Bakery, a really big bakery bakery in Miami their daughter Diana was having her practices so I've known the family for many many years Amy actually used to be my cheerleading coach in middle school and I said you know wouldn't it be great if we can sort of shoot a real one you're already in practices we could mm. shoot it she goes okay great we'll give you like I guess an hour two hours to shoot it um in this dance um dance studio which they had for only a few hours we we're starting to set up to shoot and David Vargas our director I guess had food poisoning and started to get really sick oh. And we had all these, we had like 30 kids and their parents and the studio and a sick director. And I was like, oh my gosh. And this was like super crucial because this is sort of like our turning point within like the season. So we needed this scene because everything gets exposed in this episode, in mm -hmm. this particular scene. And so in between takes of him running out to, you know, um, throw up um, oh. and then shooting and then the time we made it happen. So we sort of were just like, doing the best that we could within those circumstances, but that was the hardest, hardest scene to shoot. Wow, that's so rough. Yeah, and we only had that day. We couldn't pick another day to shoot it. It was just that time and that's it. That was it. If that you don't get it. it now, then you're screwed. We have nothing, yeah. Um, you guys decided to do this uh, as a Facebook series? Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What was the decision process that went into that? So why doing it all on Facebook? So originally I pitched to David that I thought about YouTube. I said, I definitely want to do something on YouTube. Um, but once we wrapped up everything and I sort of started looking at things and I saw Facebook was ma making original content, I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And looking mm -hmm. at how like all, like everybody that's Latino and any age too, like from, I don't know, middle school, are they on Facebook mm -hmm. or teenagers, mm -hmm. even like up to grandparents are on Facebook. I yeah. said, no, this is a show for them. This has to live on Facebook. So I just told the boys, I was like, I think this should go on Facebook and they agreed and it's on Facebook. There's not that many people that are doing that at this point. Like no. a Facebook exclusive release. Right. I feel like that's kind of, you're ahead of the curb on that one. Yeah. But it seems like something that's going to be more and more popular. Yeah, I um, think so. It's yeah. going to be like the next YouTube, yeah. you know? 
uh, it's, it's challenging the the getting the message out there, getting people interested, engaged. Everybody's like, oh, the algorithm, Facebook algorithm. It's like the new right. is this is this thing on? It's like <laughs> Facebook changed their algorithm, so nobody's like liking my comment, my posts anymore. Um, how have you guys gone about promoting the show through Facebook? And I mean, have you kind of hit it from other angles as well? Oh yeah. I think the the main thing here is that there's you only have so much time. Mm-hmm. You don't have a budget to promote this thing, to push it out and do a, like, right. a lot of Facebook ads or anything mm-hmm. like that. So you can't do everything. Right. Uh, what's like the main focus and where do you see yourself getting the message out there for this show? So I think the main focus is, I mean, to promote in all areas, right? So like we had a little small budget for Facebook ads, which had has done well for us. Um, you know, my one of my best friends, Jenny Lorenzo, who's a big youtuber um and she does cuban abuelitas her character she and i didn't even ask her she started to repost our stuff as she has a large following so we got a bulk of our sort of like viewership engagement mm. off of her alone um also just me promoting it the same way i promoted every which way going on like digital online uh, podcasts or magazines or you know um interviews things like that so i i did the cbs uh la cbs and i'm going to do some like local stuff for TV in Miami, but I'm trying to stay away from like TV and I want really focus on more of the digital um, sort of like brands or podcast and stuff like that. Right. It seems like that's going to be more of a direct connection. Like right. if it was promoting a TV show, maybe I, I guess it's tough. If it's like national TV. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're going to reach enough people, but yeah. for like a local show, you're probably not going to get as much traction right. Right. and as much direct link throughs. Right. So even for like this podcast, it would be, you know, on the YouTube account, anything, right. it would be like the link to your exactly. page or right. for Hylia. So then people could actually follow through and find it, which right. is uh, super important. It's also important, the audiences that you're connecting with, mm-hmm. because if you're going to go on like, like I don't know, a show that's about farm tractors, <laughs> like you're not going to really no. get hit your, even if there's 8 million people, <laughs> exactly. you're really not going to pull the right audience exactly. there. I think what's good is probably that you're following is probably... Um, really interested in obviously seeing what you have to say. Yeah, and they've all kind of grown up too, which is nice because they can transition with me on like what's my new sort of like content. Right, is that tough yeah. though? Because I imagine your audience is pretty young. Um, yeah. Or at least was <laughs> like oh, a couple was. years ago, five yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's it hasn't been that hard actually. I have I was worried about that because I said, well, they're probably not going to understand what I'm doing now, but they've all been really excited and sort of like transitioned fine over to the to the next project which is great Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about we were talking before the show about minimalism you said you Mm -hmm. checked out the documentary how do you feel about uh simple living and minimalism had you heard about it before the doc no no the first time i heard i mean i've heard of like simplifying your life but like not necessarily like what you talk about in the documentary um for me it changed my life because i first of all i especially between the ages of like 18 to 21 I just spent a lot of money and I was buying everything and things I didn't need. And even just to buy clothes now, like I don't, I don't go to Neiman Marcus or like back in the day, they used to be like, Oh, you got to wear designer and you have to spend all this money. And I just try, I go to Ross or I go to Marshall's and it's just like, why am I going to pay full price for anything? I look so much cuter in this clothes anyway. And I'm paying less money for it. And I don't need a closet full of things and shoes. I just, I don't, I travel a lot lighter now. I used to travel with like three bags. I travel sometimes with a carry on or if not a medium size, but it depends how long I'm staying, obviously, but sure. I don't take that many things. I've just sort of like everything has been simplified. The makeup thing, too. Oh, my gosh. I used to go to Sephora all the time. I got this card called the VIB Rouge, which means you spend over $1,000 a year just on makeup in their store. No. When I got that <laughs> card, when I got that card, I said, I have a problem. Like, yeah. I don't need, I'm not a professional makeup artist. I don't need all of this. Yeah. I go in the store once in a while if I need like a concealer that I like, but I don't do what I used to do. Like all these palettes and brushes like I don't need all that stuff Mm. so my spending has gone down tremendously um even eating too I don't buy I used to buy a lot of extra food that would spoil you know because you don't use it I just buy what I everything is what I need it's not what I necessarily want why why do you think that you had gotten caught up in the the buying of this stuff and I think a lot of it had to do especially when I was out here and I was struggling it was more of like a depressive type of thing where I felt I needed something to make me happy. I needed to buy this in order to get me excited, but it was temporarily, you know, such a little window of like happiness, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just like, Oh, I got it. I paid for it. Now I'm like, Oh, why did I spend that money? Then it starts the whole guilt trip thing, you know, and it's just not fun. 
yeah. it's just and no then you fun. end up with just a closet filled with clothing and a lot well i made my money back because i put it all on ebay oh you did <laughs> yes. that's amazing was it isn't it exciting i love doing that. oh my god it was the when i got into minimalism and uh, i started to pare down a lot of it is just stuff that especially with <laughs> at least my clothes it wasn't like yeah. nice designer clothes it was yeah. just okay give it away to goodwill i feel right. good about that i can uh, contribute to somebody uh, you know if i have a nice jacket like i, I remember because i had gotten uh, a little bit crazy myself but just buying like leather <laughs> jackets and like not that there's anything wrong with it but yeah. like it didn't suit my style personally but i like bought all this stuff that i didn't need i had mm-hmm. a tv that i a flat screen tv that i bought when i moved back home to live mm-hmm. with my parents it's like very contradictory because yeah. i'm moving home because i don't have any money and yet i'm depressed <laughs> and unhappy so I start spending money so mm-hmm. I feel I, I get that little hit like you like yep. you said but it doesn't do any like there's mm-hmm. nothing fulfilling about it there's no long-term fix mm-hmm. for just buying stuff mm-hmm. um well stuff don't validate your worth you know what I mean it doesn't or your happiness person it's just it's so temporary people yeah. have to understand that that's so temporary you don't need that stuff it seems like it, it may be even a little bit more difficult for somebody yeah. like you who uh you know who is seen by a lot of people like a lot of what you do is how you present yourself in the world yeah and you have i mean so where do you where's that line right where's that line of like you don't need the designer stuff but right. still you want to look nice and you want to you know yeah i mean for me i mean some it depends what the event is right so like a lot of like the big events like kids choice and stuff i'm lucky enough that designers will lend me their clothes and i wear it and i give it back um and that even happens with local shops as well but like for example like this shirt i've already worn another interview Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I should get another outfit because they already saw me. And I was like, why? It's such, I love this shirt. And it's from Topshop. And I'll just do a different, I did my hair picked up with red lips on the other shoot. I'll wear my hair down with like a nude lip on this one. Mm. I'm like, hey, if Kate Middleton can recycle her outfits, so can I. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? And that's sort of like, that's what's important to me. It's not, and what I want people to sort of like get from me is more of my message. And yes, I understand that the look is important because you have to sort of like, you have to portray yourself as to who you really are. And this is me, you know, mm-hmm. um, and I love makeup and hair and I love all that stuff. But also too, I don't want to be too extra or try to like come across as somebody I'm not. I'm not going to come in a Valentino dress because, oh, I have to wear a designer. Right. You so, know? Yeah. Because you, you don't really want that to, to do be that. what impresses someone. Yeah. I mean, also, if that's the if that's what impresses the person that you're hanging out with, maybe right. that's like not the most healthy relationship. You want people right. to value what you're bringing to the table, you know, what yeah. you've created. Yeah, uh, totally. As opposed to what you're wearing. And I think our generation is very much like that. I don't think we care so much about that fancy stuff. I think we like more authentic, you know, sort of like authenticity, simple Show me who you really are. Yeah. Not, it, not don't be this other person, this big person. It is starting to change. And it, there is like a, a scale that's being tipped to people valuing experiences more. Like mm-hmm. the American dream has changed in a yeah. lot of ways. The American dream isn't being a lawyer or a doctor mm-hmm. anymore. For a lot of people, it's, um, you know, having the freedom to to work where you want, when mm-hmm. you want, to not be tied to debt. To, yeah. There's Because obviously debt is now a huge factor huge. in a lot of people's decision making. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's great to have people like you that, that really promote a healthy me- message, especially for yeah. young girls, because I think it's easier for them to get caught up in need the makeup, need the stuff, need yeah. the clothing in order to be happy. Yeah, um, especially with Instagram. The makeup is yeah. such a big thing now. Like all these Instagram girls with the highlighter and the contouring and the whole thing. Like, I don't, I don't think you need to, I think you should enhance your face, not change your face. Hmm. You know, like find the pretty parts of your face and highlight that, but don't contour and make yourself look like somebody else. Like I am in shock when I go on Instagram and I see that Mm -hmm. the heaviness of it to just become someone else. I don't think you should do that. Yeah. Because in the same way of masking your yourself with these clothing or extra stuff, like Mm -hmm. you don't want to mask who you are. Yeah. Um, You want to be able to be comfortable in your own skin and be able to, and like, that's not to say that makeup is bad. You're right. But it's, there's a balance there. There's a balance. You should just enhance. That's it. You should not change who you are. You should not give yourself a nose job or like Botox, like with the make, you just shouldn't. And like just be you yeah. you know like i contour very little right here but i don't i don't really do that i do more of a bronzer just because i need to look not pale because my i don't get sun on my face <laughs> yeah i refuse to get sun on my face oh I don't really want, yeah because i how my, do you do it i just i literally lay out but i put something over like like something either the like my hats. shorts or a hat or something yeah. to cover because like my dad said that he knew this woman in her 80s that she did not have any wrinkles and her secret was because she didn't get sun that's it 
I no, you like, gotta oh. get sun though. But not on your face. Oh, uh, what? How do you go to the beach? I just cut. Well, umbrella. I wear a hat. Yeah. Yeah. I li- well, if I have an umbrella, I'll just put my body out and leave my head inside. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. My girlfriend does the. I mean, she does a lot with the sunscreen and, and the yes. sun care for the mm-hmm. face. Uh, she's very cautious. She's Asian, so uh, her mom, who listens to this podcast, Lynn, oh, she's great. amazing. Uh, she she always says you got to put the eye the not the makeup. It's like the eye cream. I guess there's oh, cream. Oh, the eye cream. Yeah. Yep. What is eye the cream. eye cream? What is that? Well, it's supposed to prevent wrinkles. I don't know if it really does. Yeah. But it's great like for under makeup because it smooths out the concealer. I mean, I can go on and tell you all these. I, yeah. Listen, this Sephora is... did me well in the sense of like <laughs> I really learned a lot of tips and tricks. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, Somebody just recently said, I just started this uh, a vegan diet. So uh, You did? Yeah. I just oh, you started. Did? Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I tried it. It wasn't um, for me. Yeah. So Rich Roll is on the podcast next week and he's, uh, he's amazing and he, he's... Uh, he's been a vegan. He basically had this amazing midlife turnaround at okay. 45 years old where he uh, became a vegan and then an ultra endurance athlete, started running these Ironman races. He actually ran five Ironman races in a week oh, wow. on a vegan diet, um, which is Whoa. like crazy because it's uh, contrary to what a lot of, a lot right. of people think. It's like, oh, you go on a vegan diet, you're going to get weaker. Right. So my thing is like, I want to go into this vegan diet, but I want to try to get stronger right uh, somebody actually said that the reason i bring it up is because uh i was out last night and the waitress said because I, I told her i was vegan and i'm trying to figure out okay what can i pick from this <laughs> menu and she's helping me out right honestly the only thing that i ended up getting was just this arugula salad it was just like stems That's and it. olives they didn't have anything That's else it. but now i have a little bit more empathy for people who are yeah. vegan i also understand like you have to look at the menu before you go to the restaurant yep but she said your skin looks amazing yeah. i don't i think she might have just been talking me up it really does uh, thank you <laughs> it does but uh maybe the vegan diet's helping no um, it works i mean when yeah. i i did it for four months um last year and it works i actually I did lo- lose a lot of weight um but it just wasn't for me i yeah. i'm I was in that sort of like situation where you are now where you're trying to figure out like what to eat to make your energy go up because I was a very low energy, had a lot of headaches um, and I wasn't really doing carbs because they were like, oh, well, you probably ate a lot of carbs and I'm and although I love them. I wasn't. I was I was following. Actually, I was following that book, um, The 20 Day Revolution or mm, something. I haven't heard it. Um, it's Beyonce's trainer or something. Wow. That had, yeah. Yeah. Um, I should know this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was good. It was great, but it just wasn't it wasn't for me. Yeah. It wasn't for me. You know what's great though is that you have to experiment and try new yes. things and you have to be open to it because yeah. I, I get into that too of like, oh, I would never do a vegan diet. I could never do it. I would never do a vegan diet. But then now here I'm doing it yeah. because I think you have to be open to trying new things, open to new experiences. Yeah, totally. Even if it's minimalism, it's like, all right, Courtney Carver has this amazing Project 333 where it's yep. you whittle down your wardrobe. And I think oftentimes the wardrobe is the best place to start because most mm-hmm. of us only use 80% or sorry, only like 20% of what's in our closet. 80% goes unused. Um, so you just take 33 items, shoes, jewelry, whatever, shirts, shoes, and you only live on that for 33 days. Mm-hmm. Like that's all you wear. And it's a great experiment to start yeah, to totally. figure out what you need, what you don't need. And it's not forever. Like you still got your stuff. You didn't throw anything out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the same thing with me for this diet. What? So what diet do you go on now? Like is it just no diet? Just, so what's clean? Like a lot of people talk about that. So clean eating is just, um, you know, really if I have a f- something fried, it's not every day. It's maybe once yeah. in a blue moon. Like just, you know, a lot of greens. I'd like to make sure that my... Uh, plate is balanced so my protein my carbs and my veggies and i have my fruits every day um and a lot of water i try to drink Mm. at least a gallon of water a day like that's sort of like my goal um so that's pretty much it just very very clean in that sense and very balanced yeah so i'm not necessarily like on a diet um which actually did gain some of the weight back from the vegan diet that i did but it's fine like i just wanted my body to sort of like do what it wanted to do in a healthy way not to say, you know, because I'm not overweight or underweight. I'm fine. I'm normal. Yeah. So it's like oh, I want to work out to feel good about myself and eat good so that I can survive my days. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's got to be hard, yeah. though, going back home with the Cuban meals. You're telling me. It's, it's, it's not vegan. No, it is not vegan. What did, you, what did your parents think about that when you said? <laughs> oh, my mom thought I was crazy. She yeah. was like, I ate everything and I was fine as a kid or whatever. Yeah. She's like, I gave you guys chips and I gave you this. And I was like, yeah. see, that I don't really like to do is like the processed stuff. Yeah. I stay away from from that were there yeah. any food documentaries for you that that uh 
kind of oh yeah food ink is it yeah yeah wasn't that really amazing good. that was one of like the first ones that was like oh yeah. shit i'm not allowed to eat chicken anymore yeah. <laughs> although i eat chicken i mean not now not during now, this 30 yeah. day thing but i do eat chicken and you know but you just have to be a little bit more aware of where it comes yeah. from but like yeah it's it's amazing what a documentary or a book can do to kind of open your eyes up to a different world and yeah you think a little differently well when i was around 22 23 i i got a lot of acne all of a sudden like all over my cheeks like really really bad and i was never an acne kid or or teenager um and i was really struggling i was trying everything and i couldn't get rid of this acne so i found this book called um god i think it's called well she's very big on the glowing green smoothie but I forgot the name of her book. Kim, Kimberly Snyder mm-hmm. is her name, the author of this book. I came across her book in a Barnes and Noble, and it, like in the back, it says something about like losing weight, but also um, acne. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, what is this? I gotta get into it. So that's when I started educating myself on plant-based diets and green smoothies and all that sort of like stuff. That I started to get more curious about food, mm-hmm. and I started watching you know documentaries like Food Inc. And there was a lot of other ones on Netflix that I've watched. Um, I recently did watch What the Health, um, mm-hmm. but I feel at this point I've watched so many they're all the same. Yeah. So it's really hard for me to sort of say, "Oh, this is what I picked up from this one," or that. They're all kind of the same for me in yeah. a weird way. You know, you know what it tips is that the the first one you watch is the most important yes. because then it gets you to start to think a little bit differently, opens your mind up to a different uh, lifestyle. But yeah. then it's the other ones it keeps you on track. It keeps you focused on eating healthy. Or for me, it's every year I read a book on personal finance. Yeah. Coming from a place where I was in debt, a hundred thousand dollars, bought a brand new car. (laughs) And so I'm in like $117,000 in debt living in my parents' basement. Uh, I was like, I, that's a, that was a low for me. And I was like, I, don't ever want to be in that position again. Mm-hmm. And what helped me, it was first reading a book about personal finance, uh, Dave Ramsey, Total Money Makeover. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, incredible book. It's a little bit corny, but it was for me, it was the first time I had gotten really good advice about personal finance. And it was like, okay, now every year, it's the same shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like reading about the same stuff every single year uh, and the same principles about not getting into credit card debt, not using your credit cards. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of these principles, which... But you just need to relearn them and just keep yourself motivated Mm -hmm. because oftentimes we can go off track. You know, progress is in a straight line. Yeah. Sometimes we slip up and sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we buy the thing that we don't need. Yeah. But then we can be aware of that and then give it up or sell yeah it. and even with like your career like i'm always investing my money back into my career sometimes i'm like well you know you gotta kind of go 50 50 you gotta be yeah. like you gotta eat and then you also gotta like you know <laughs> feed the monster of the business yeah. but that was a big thing for me too coming out of every which way was that i was putting in all my money back into sort of my career so i had to find a balance yeah so. that's one of the things where i i have the same struggle and i will make so many excuses to put the money in my business well right. it's my business I'm exactly. going to buy those new headphones. I'm going to do this yep. and that. Um, I'd rather do that with my business and my personal life because yep. I know it's not just self-satisfying. Uh, it's actually building something and helping in some way. But like, you're right. There's certainly a line. And yeah. like I love what you're doing with the the your video blogs where it's just everything shot with your iPhone. Yeah. Well, you know, I was very tempted to buy a camera. I have a camera. So my dad gave me his Canon from like 2010. But the thing is that that camera is very big and I can't really walk around with it. Mm-hmm. And I don't have sort of like, I can't have uh, somebody following me around all the time because I don't have the money to pay them anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I said, you know what? I This would be really a big lesson for me to learn, but I think that this would help other people that want to sort of vlog now put excuses to not sort of vlog because they don't have a camera or lighting or a crew or whatever. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to do the whole thing off of an iPhone. I don't care what the quality looks like. I don't, the whole point is, can the story resonate? Can the story be executed? Does it matter the device or does it matter what you have? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's it's sort of like using what, I guess it's the minimum minimalism mentality. It's like, yeah. okay, what do I have? And this is what I'm going to use. And I'm not going to overextend myself to try to make something happen because, oh, I need to impress people or yeah, whatever. Yeah, the, the best camera is the one that you have. Mm-hmm. And uh, don't let the additional questions uh, and the uncertainty of mm-hmm. 
entering into a project prevent you from starting because exactly that, that it's so easy to say ah, i don't have this camera oh I, you know i'm not really good at editing well it's like how do you get good you just start you, you start, start making it i started out with a sony handycam it was <laughs> you know on a, the iphones shoot a thousand times better than this handycam and oh it was gosh. like so so tedious and so difficult to edit and when you're capturing the footage you'd have to literally wait minute by minute so if i shot five hours of footage i'd have to wait five hours for it to record onto my computer right. and i was editing on a Windows Movie Maker is like what I started on okay. and this stuff is not intuitive it's not that easy no. back when I started and but it gave me the skills that I needed to move forward it, it gave me a basic understanding of how to tell a story mm -hmm. um, and you can't expect the first thing you ever make to just take off and be everything exactly it's always about that that process of learning and, mm -hmm. and correcting on the mistakes that you made before and correcting on the successes you've had before yeah um, you ready for quick questions? Yeah. All right, cool. So they're, they're quick questions, but not quick answers. Okay. <laughs> so you can feel free to expand on it. Don't feel like you have to answer as quick as possible or in uh, one tweet. Okay. So what one book has had the biggest impact on your life? Um, it's a Joel Austin book, and, it was, and it's called, not was called, is called uh, Every Day is a Friday. And it's funny because when I picked up that book, I didn't think I needed it. Um, I had was I had already come out of sort of this um, depression, anxiety sort of like situation right when I moved back after LA. And um, I thought I was fine. I was like, I'm fine. I don't really need this book. But I started to kind of look through it and I said, well, maybe I have little things that I need to fix about myself. Um, and that book changed my whole life. Like just the way that I look at life and... Um, just sort of getting out of this little funk that I was in and uh and then after that is when things started falling into place like every which way and just everything just started to make sense and my life was making sense after that book what's the outlook that you took out from it I think it's sort of just that mind switch thing you know what I mean it's, it's sort of like when you think of something is bad just think of always positive right so from negative to positive and I was always like that as a kid I just had a little bit of it turned off during those three years little after that too <laughs> mm -hmm. I would say four maybe five years that I was sort of dealing with um with that mental emotional struggle um and I had to go back to who I used to be and that book helped me do that because I was always a very positive optimistic kid I remember going to school and kids were like why are you always so happy all the time and I was like I don't know I just am and I just was I just I, I do what I was going to be when I grew up I know I was going to be an actress you know my parents were just like these great parents they gave me a lot of love um my parents were always involved like always talking to me about you know what's going on in school and just involved you know so I had a very good home um and so I was just a happy kid you know mm -hmm. and so I wanted to go back to that person I wanted to find her again I wanted to be her again mm. yeah and that very, book helped me it's very easy to lose that and to to, yeah. to overthink as you get older yeah exactly what drives you you know fear drives me a lot fear of just like not doing what I want to do like my biggest fear is like waking up and I'm 80 and like I didn't do anything in my life or I didn't try you know like for me like it was funny because moving out to LA felt super natural to me but a lot of my friends were like you're not going to go to school like what if you don't make it and that kind of was like I had a little bit of fear of that but not really I was always like if I don't do this now when am I ever going to do this like when am I ever going to really try I can't say I didn't try even if I failed mm -hmm. to doing it I that's fine if I failed because of me it's fine you know but I can't fail because I didn't try that's not okay with me that doesn't sit well with me at all so fear drives me every day all day like I don't care how scared I am I have to do it because I'm afraid of waking up and saying oh I could have if I would have just tried a little bit I could have you know how do you consistently push yourself into fear because you overcome one thing you mm -hmm. do your first tv show you do your first interview on tv um it becomes a little bit easier is it is it about continuing to push yourself and find yeah. those new fears every day you just have to do it every I, whatever you're scared of doing it just do it it's it's the, i think there's a famous line that says like feel the feel the fear and do it anyway and just sort of you just have to because in life not just in career but even in personal life too like i've been with my boyfriend for 12 years and we've done long distance twice and people are like how in the world are you guys still together and i'm like we're just we don't give up on each other like so i just feel like it's you, you can't quit you just have to keep doing it and you have to just jump just do it just do it don't be scared it's <laughs> great advice what one skill have you leveraged in a way that others haven't? Ah, that is such a good question. Oh my God, I don't even know how to answer this. Because <laughs> I don't even know, like, you know, you live in your own sort of like headspace where you just, you don't really know all the things you've accomplished or done. Mm -hmm. 
I think for me, um, you know, it's funny. I think for me, it's definitely like I don't get desperate easily. And I've seen a lot of my friends, especially in the industry, um, because they feel like they're always running out of time, get desperate. And so they don't have enough patience. And so they make wrong mistakes and then they shoot themselves in the foot. Um, when I start to feel that, cause it's very natural for you to feel <clears throat> like you're running out of time or, oh my God, I've got to get this deal or I've got to get this meeting or whatever. Um, and then you sort of just, you don't, first of all, you don't come across very well with that other person. So they don't really want to work with you. They're like, oh, this person's too desperate. And second of all, you say the wrong things. You know, you're probably not even prepared. Um, it's just not good. I think I manage my desperate tendencies or like my mm. lack of patience. Well, I feel like once I feel that way, I, I kind of say, okay, calm down this is a process trust the process it's going to be fine you need to have patience nothing happens overnight um and i think a lot of people don't know how to do that especially our generation has a lot of lack of of patience so they need to find that quick (laughs) (laughs) when are you happiest i'm happiest um okay so i'm happiest with my family i'm such like a family person like I love being around my family. Like they all went to Disney world last week and I was like really sad that I wasn't there. Cause like my cousins are having babies now. And so like, I feel like I'm their aunt, like, although like I'm not technically, Mm -hmm. um, we're very close. Like all their cousins were very, like we call each other brother and sister. Um, so like being around my family makes me happiest and working makes me so happy. Like this whole schedule that I've sort of created for myself because I'm the one creating my whole world is um making me happy like the crazier that i am the busier that i am the happier that i am because i really love what i do so much Mm. um it's funny my boyfriend had asked me that question not too long ago he's like would you be okay with like being a housewife and be financially taken care of and and all that and i was like no Mm -hmm. and he's like but why everybody wants that i'm like "Mm, not me because that's just that's not my personality it doesn't suit me i love to work I've always loved to work since I was like a little girl. So like, I love what I'm doing now. This makes me so happy. That's amazing. <laughs> love it. Um, let's see a couple more questions here. Okay. What's the simplest advice that's the most important to follow? You know, not to give up. My dad used to tell me it all the time. And also like, if you don't believe in yourself, who will? My dad was very big on that as well. Um, and not giving up is so simple and so cliche and repeated, but it's so true. Like you just can't, like even if it takes you a zillion years to get there, you just have to keep doing it. Because mm-hmm. when you really fail is when you quit. That's that's the true definition of failure. Not you like having these small little setbacks. That's not a failure. You know, that's gonna help you to grow, to actually accomplish your dream and actually be able to execute because you can't be like born and then be the president tomorrow, like, or be the president of Nickelodeon tomorrow. Like you have to have a path. Um, There is no overnight success that doesn't exist. (laughs) Great. Two more questions. Actually, no, oh man, we got a good one here. Um, So, all right. I'm, I'm, I've got a big goal to get The Rock on my podcast. Oh, As you can see over your shoulder, I, I got The Rock that. right there. That's why that's there. I just, I don't have a, I'm not the a stalker. The Rock is the bomb. The Rock is so good. So You're good. from Florida. The Rock yeah. lives down in Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, here's the thing. Like, I don't have a lot of of clout. Like, uh, The Rock doesn't know who I am. I'm, I'm a nobody. I'm just a guy <laughs> with a podcast. You are not a nobody, <laughs> trust me. All right. So you have I'm, one of the best documentaries on Netflix. You are not a nobody. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I, I feel like to get The Rock on my podcast, to achieve this goal, I need some friends to help me out okay. and to pitch The Rock uh, to come on the podcast. So okay. what I've been having a lot of people do is to look into that camera right there okay. and uh, and and ask The Rock if he would please come on to Matt's podcast. Okay, so you want to look at that camera? Yeah, yeah. Okay, The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, you have to, and I am ordering you to come to Matt's here, to his little podcast right here. This is amazing. To come and do a podcast with Matt. You want to know why? Because he is one of the best creators I've ever met in my life. He has the best documentary on Netflix right now. The best, and I'm not even kidding. So you need to come here and, and you need to be a part of this podcast because you're the bomb and he's the bomb. And two bomb people need to be in the same podcast. Okay? <laughs> That's, so come, Nelly, you need to come. <laughs> that's so good. Thank you so much. Holy shit. You're um, that might do it. I feel like that might tip the scale. I think the might... Nelly was, was good. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Nelly Ming. Yeah, come, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe a little pit bull for him might work. Yeah, I, I'm persuaded. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for that. I, 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 what, I'm, I'm, what I think I'm going to do, and I'm probably, I might cut some of this out. I think this was actually fun though. Sometimes That's I cut so it out. fun. I but love I, it. I want to actually make this like kind of a collaborative video okay. to pitch the rock because he's got such a great ground up story. Oh, so he's great. like, and he, he's so passionate. 
passionate and yeah. he's just the guy that just proves that there is no making it there is no, no there final isn't. destination it's the work that you do every day loving what you do that is the most important part yeah i honestly for me he's like somebody that i admire and strive to be um because what he's done and created for himself is sort of like what i would love to do i think what he does with this production company is just like incredible so like him oprah walt disney are like my top people yeah yeah it also comes back to too what you're saying about just connecting with the fans and the mm-hmm. audience and and just being genuine so well. oh my god it's so so yeah. well he always makes time for people and i think that's something that um it can it's easily overlooked as the more success comes mm-hmm. your way and well it's it's you're grateful that yeah. that and that's what he's doing he's like i i have to be grateful for you because without you i would not be here where i am today and so i have to do sort of give back yeah. by tweeting you or you know, or being on this podcast. Great. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see if that works out. Uh, I've got patience. So yes. I think I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to wait it out on this one. Um, so two more questions here. What one thing should people read, watch, or listen to before they go to bed tonight? I have this app called Calm that I love. Um, and so it just like puts me to sleep because it walks you through sort of like your sleep steps. Mm. Um, but I'm always out in the first two minutes. I think it's like 20 minutes long and like two minutes I'm like done. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's check so out great. Calm. Um, and lastly, where should people connect with you online? Um, so everywhere is at melikarkache.com. M-E-L-I-C-A-R-C-A-C-H-E. All right, Melissa, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. This is fun. We have to do it again. Yeah. Maybe next time when The Rock is here. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for listening to The Ground Up Show. If you like this podcast, there's something you can do right now to help. Head on over to iTunes and leave a quick review. I print out every single one and I put them up on my mood board above my bed. Okay, that's not true. But I still notice and appreciate every one. For more on The Ground Up Show, including behind the scenes videos, check out groundupshow.com. Thanks for listening.